I was expecting to be sued by some or all of you, and it's uh, quite a surprise to be invited to speak to you. Um, it's really, well, more on that in a second. Um, how many of you um, are, haven't read the article that generated this? Uh, I guess that's an embarrassing question. How many of you have read it? All right, so possibly not all of you. Uh, I thought that might be the case, so I'm going to quickly run through the basics of what I did so that we're all on the same page. Um, this is actually the publisher that got the whole thing started for me uh, two years ago. Um, I, res I didn't know anything. I still know very little about academic publishing. Uh, in spite of coming from molecular biology and publishing papers, um, it's kind of a mysterious industry that I just never knew much about. Um, but then I got a complaint from a scientist that was forwarded to me uh, by the editors of Science, and I was sort of motivated to look deeply into this. And this was the publisher that started it all, um, Scientific and Academic Publishing. Um, I was faced with uh, uh, journals that look like this. They have tons of them, uh, and it looked completely legit. I, I really don't think um, uh, anyone would be able to just look at this journal and tell that anything was suspicious. Uh, it claims to be uh, to have provided a continuous form for the dissemination of thoroughly peer-reviewed fundamental international research into the preparation properties of macromolecules. It didn't take me long to come up with where all that comes from. So Wiley has published uh, since 1946 um, uh, the Journal uh, of uh, Polymer Science. This is part A, Polymer Chemistry, where I found that uh, it has indeed provided a continuous form for the dissemination of thoroughly peer-reviewed fundamental international research and the preparation of properties of macromolecules. Um, essentially, what I quickly discovered, which maybe you all are, have long been wise to, is that uh, it's incredibly easy to set up a journal these days. Uh, you can essentially uh, be an entrepreneur um, with some rudimentary web skills, and on a weekend, you can clone the website of a, of a real journal change some things around, hook it up to a PayPal account, and you're off to the races. All you need are some suckers, and you do that by spamming scientists. Um, I don't think this is uh, actually limited to the lone entrepreneur uh, you know, in his bedroom. I think, actually, this is a model that many of the largest publishing houses have now taken up, but we can talk about that later. So I uh, did the following experiment. The first question I wanted to answer was, um, how many such publishers are there? And when I say such publishers, I mean gold open access, um, because that's what, that was the nature of the original complaint. Um, it was involved with uh, author fees. So I, I barely was aware of what open access was, the difference between gold and green. So I, I went about, like any journalist does, uh, starting by surveying the field. And I found the DOAJ. It's uh, an outfit out of Sweden that has tried um, real goodwill effort uh, to keep track of all of these um, open access publishers and um, provide a wonderful API. I was able to download spreadsheets of data, filtering as I went. They, they do a marvelous job in terms of providing this resource. Um, and I was able to harvest. I, I had some search criteria that I put in, and I harvested uh, several thousand journals. But if you're going to do a comprehensive survey, you also, of course, have to consider the Batman of academic publishing, Jeffrey Beal. Um, whom I have tremendous respect for and uh, also, after talking with him on, on the phone, realized that he also has a very strong personality. And I think you also, I, I think you would have to be such a person to do what he has done. Um, it's, it's vitally important that he has done it and he's also done a crummy job in being fair. Um, anyway, you, got, you guys are all probably aware of this mixed bag, which is Jeffrey Beale's list. And there are indeed, this is just a snapshot, a screenshot that I grabbed um, a month ago. It keeps on growing, and it's his personal blacklist of bad guys. Uh, how do you get on the list? No one knows. How do you get off the list? More mysterious. Um, why is anyone on the list? No one keeps track. So, you know, and yet uh, it was useful for me, for my task, of trying to find a full survey of the gold open access publishers of the world because I found that he had captured a population which had only a thin overlap with the DOAJ. So between the two of them, I figured, right, I probably have the whole set, more or less. So uh, then I wrote a very bad science paper. And uh, in a nutshell, it's a, it's a mad lib on the theme of molecule X from lichen species Y inhibits cancer cell Z. 
and I swapped in and out um, um, molecules. I, I made a big database of molecules and uh, lichen species, and um, you know every paper is a unique snowflake, and uh, and completely wrong. This uh, here's just a, a little taste. This claims to be erythroglossin. Uh, this is actually erythroglossin, um, but the the most egregious mistake that I wanted to make incredibly easy for any peer reviewer to spot within a minute of reviewing this paper is right there in the very first graph, the linchpin result of the paper. Uh, as it says from the caption, this is dose-dependent effect of molecule X on cancer cells Z. And uh, it covers, if you look at the uh, x-axis here, six orders of magnitude of concentration. And I think you would agree that that's anything but dose-dependent. So right from the get-go, uh, any peer reviewer who's actually peer reviewing this paper should be able to spot red flags sufficient to dismiss it out of hand by design. Um, I also made a fancy version of the paper uh, in case anyone ever came back to me with actual peer review. If they said fix anything, and I mean anything, I had also computer generated a, ref a uh, refined, uh, improved version of the paper that I would send to them. It's exactly the same paper. It has a few pretty pictures in it and uh, one extra method, some more references, but the, the flaws are all there and identical. And uh, slowly but surely, stuff came back to me. Um, I'm skipping a massive step, which is me for a year secretly spending uh, two hours a day submitting papers and dealing with the review process. But fast forward, uh, once it gets going, then a steady stream of things uh, that look like acceptance letters or rejection letters or review would come back. Here's an example that I find interesting um, because this is one of the small subset that actually involved an identification of one of the fatal flaws. I categorized all of the papers that I submitted in their output uh, in terms of their peer review. None means absolutely no change was asked and it was accepted or rejected. Superficial, which was the vast majority of the actual review cases, is that they asked me uh, to add more references or change it to their format, essentially offloading the job of the editorial and copy editing department of a supposed publishing house to the author, uh, which, by the way, I think is now standard practice. And then here's the interesting thing. They actually said, hey, figure two looks really funny. Um, the outcome of this review, after I sent them this version fancier, which didn't change figure two at all, was accepted. So there's a real strange corner case. Um, in a small fraction, in the Venn diagram of egregious outputs, there is this very strange place where someone's going through the motions of peer review. Why bother if you're running a fraudulent journal? I don't know. And then ignoring it and rubber stamping acceptance. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's just a bad day. So um, finally, for those who accepted, I would get an invoice. Um, uh, in this case, it's uh, send 500 bucks. And uh, whenever I got to this stage, I would send a standard email saying, oh, we just noticed that the most terrible flaw in our paper, um, we have to, um, it invalidates the results, we have to withdraw our paper, we're going to repeat these experiments and get right back to you. And in most cases, um, they, you know, client side, they were really fine with that. You know, basically no problem. And so I felt off the hook for what in, in the end amounted to hundreds of thousands of dollars of author fees. Um, the output of all this, as some of you may know, um, was essentially a big laundry list. Um, I, I put all the data, including the entire transcript of, of the emails exchanged with all these journals online, and this handy dandy list of uh, accepted versus rejected outcomes. Um, I encourage you all to find this using Google with Who's Afraid of Peer Review? That'll get you there. You gotta click on, click on the data and documents side. It's, I wish we had a better interface. Um, uh, we're kind of locked into it. Um, but find your favorite publisher or journal and see, um, see what happened. Oh, here's Elsevier. Look, just by accident. There's every email that shows the whole arc from the submission to the acceptance of the paper. Enjoy. This is what the world of gold open access publishing looks like. We transformed the data into a map 
The red dots are acceptances of the fake paper. The green dots, it's really hard to see in this light, but uh, if you, uh, if you uh, take a look at it at your leisure, it's really fun to browse through. You can click on any one of these. Here's, here's a fraudulent journal in Germany, the International Journal of Health Research and Innovation. Here are all the emails. It's all public and open access. And uh, what I was able to do, so a lot of these publishers uh, obfuscate their true locations, the actual identities of the editors, and for a good reason. That first journal I showed you, the American Journal of Polymer Science, is anything but American. I feel like that's a little sin. Okay, so you're not American. Right? It's just a name. But there's really much more to it. Uh, if you go to their supposed address and put it into, which is in California, and you put it into Google Maps, it shows you the intersection of two highways in the middle of nowhere. There's no telephone numbers. I eventually got an email at 3 a.m. Eastern time from someone with broken English saying, of course we're an American journal based in California. Um, I feel like these, these kind of, this accumulation of... Um, dishonesties is really kind of, you should be worried about that because uh, as in, you know, in the case of this uh, publisher, it wasn't this journal, it was a different one. They accepted the paper essentially out of hand. And um, so, you know, if you, if you scratch the surface and there's just a lot of dishonesty, it's probably because there's nothing underneath that thing. So uh, I was able to harvest a lot of metadata from these guys through this process. When you become a client, the information gushes. If you're a journalist, as I was honestly in the beginning, you don't get an email for months. As soon as you're a paying customer, they're sending you invoices which reveal where the banks are. Um, they are uh, sending you emails uh, which I was able to, uh, from which I was able to extract IP addresses from the raw headers. These lines show the actual locations of the banks and editors that are connected to these publishing houses. As you can see, it's a very complex network. There's a big trunk of green between North America and Europe, as you'd expect. Okay, those are the good guys, at least at this level. They're, they're sort of doing peer review, at least. And uh, yet, they are far from clean. America is sort of 50-50 red and green. There's plenty, plenty of fake journals based there, either uh, the editors or the banks. It's where the money's flowing. Uh, but sort of the, the very disappointing story was that the developing world is just swamped with fake journals. And Nigeria has a big crop, and India is the global hotspot of fake journals. It's just a sea of red. Uh, and there are tendrils reaching out from India to... Oops. All right. Oh. Uh, all over the place. So here's one. This looks interesting. Here's, here's an editor based in the Seychelles. It's a good life. Um, say, is that right? Yeah. The, oh, no, the publisher is based in the Seychelles. Yeah, that's right. In, I remember this one. In this case, uh, they claim to be elsewhere, but the uh, who is internet registration uh, of the publishing website actually reveals that it was established in the Seychelles. Um, here's one that's based in Ethiopia. Um, the editor's based in Ethiopia. The bank's in India. So, you know, there's just all kinds of things. Um, my favorite is in Japan. This is the medical journal of uh, the Kobe University School of Medicine. Um, I got an email with the, with the uh, stamp of approval, which is very impressive. Oh, well, actually, I, it's a little bit harder to find. But I have to click on here, maybe. If I can find it, it's worth showing. Uh, the uh, stamp of approval from this professor. Oh, God. Um, from Kobe University. No, oh, that's the invoice. No, it's a submission. Oh, yeah, they kept on wanting me to do paperwork on that one. Well, buried in here somewhere is uh, the acceptance letter with this beautiful stamp, embossed stamp. In Japan, You, if you're official of any kind, you have your own stamp, and it's from this professor. Anyway, I, I bring this up to, uh, to point out, I've, I've checked, there have been no consequences for anyone that I know of. A few cases, and they're the, pe the people who I frankly think least deserve it. Some poor schmuck in uh, Saudi Arabia, he's not even Saudi, lost his job. I had, to, I had to hear his sad story through months of emails about the consequences because he was named in the story. But the vast majority of people um, who essentially were perpetrating all this fraud were not named specifically, even though all the emails are all there. No one's looking into it. No one seems to be paying attention. A few journals were 
sort of, uh, you know, with great cir- pomp, pomp and circumstance, canceled by the publisher, like Pinbrick, one of one of our hundred titles that you know we generated in a weekend by s- spoofing originally some real publisher. Uh, I don't think there've been any any actual consequences, but uh, well, time will tell. I hear the DOAJ is cleaning up their filter. Um, half of their journals, approximately, accepted my fake paper. They're the good guys list. Beal, it was more like eighty percent, something. Like so, you know, which is also, actually, I think that's kind of just as bad. It shows that one out of five Beal bad guys was actually making a goodwill effort to not accept everything over the transom. Uh, anyway, uh, how am I doing on time? I promise to keep track and I haven't. All right, so CODA. Um, weirdly, this experience uh, is reminiscent for me of my reporting in Afghanistan. Bear with me. Um, that's a case where I completely ignorantly and naively went into a situation to investigate something. And it, I was dealing with an incredibly large organization, namely the peacekeeping forces in Afghanistan, um, with the uh, assumption that everyone was corrupt and everyone involved uh, was just out to do no good. And once I got there, uh, my, my actual goal was to get... Um, a civilian casualty data set. They, the military claimed that it wasn't keeping track of civilian casualties. I, a little bird within the military told me that it was happening, and if you just ask the right questions of the right people, you can actually maybe convince them to give it to you. And a lot of us in the military want it to be public. Um, you know, A lot of us actually care about what our organization stands for and what it's doing. And uh, I didn't believe it, but I got there, I embedded with the forces, and I actually met the people who were curing the data, and it took a lot of effort, uh, not because there are, there's some cabal of bad guys at the top trying to prevent it. It's just the nature of a large industry-related organization, hierarchical and messy, that um, bad things get done, and uh, that tarnishes the name of the organization, and no one can seem to do anything about it. And the ones who can save it are the ones within who reach out quietly to a journalist and tell them what's actually happening and guide them through to get the answers they need. And that's what happened, and I was absolutely impressed by the people I interacted with, and ultimately they did release that data set, um, as embarrassing as it might be. If you're bothering to collect how many people are dying uh, in, you know, for the sake of your missions, it's worth the world knowing that information if, you, if you're claiming that you're trying to minimize those numbers. And indeed, in some ways, they were actually bringing those numbers down. Anyway, the reason I bring this up is... Um, I think your industry is, uh, I think you know that your industry in the eyes of uh, scientists is absolutely corrupted. Uh, It seems to have, it seems to now hold science itself in contempt often. Not just do a poor job, but actually hold your stated mission of being in the service of knowledge and stewardship and, and science in contempt, openly in contempt. Though, you know, not those who pay attention, that is. Most sort of are dimly aware and they don't care. But, uh, the people who do care, and you've heard their voices, are, are just furious. And my sting was, is nothing. That, that reputation had been established solidly before I got into this. And uh, it's not just, you know, these guys in India and Nigeria trying to make a buck. It's the big dogs. Guys, you guys know exactly who you are. You know, you know what's going on. And I, my theory is that uh, academic publishing has drifted so far from its original idealistic roots with scientists taking care of the whole last step in the scientific process from experiment to sharing the news about it. Uh, you know, it, it, in this world of the internet and expensive publishing processes, it basically a cottage industry grew up that has now grown into a massive multi-billion dollar industry that has become estranged from the ideals that were probably naive to begin with, but you can be idealistic and do a good job and make a profit. That is not mutually exclusive. So, if, if you feel like there's something wrong in academic publishing, particular, I'm talking at the particular level, you don't have to have some grand answer to everything. If you know about something, you can actually contact someone like me or Ivan. Our job is to listen to you. And we protect our sources. I actually will, I would love to go to jail to protect your identity. That's actually a queer kind of secret desire of every journalist. So don't feel like, oh, I can't do it because, you know, I'm going to lose my job. No, you don't even have to lose your job. You just have to talk to us. 